On the Bootstrap Founder today is Mike Taylor, a prompt engineering expert. We talk about AI, why AI is more like people than you would think, how to build the perfect prompt, and how the field of AI is developing and will develop for indie hackers, founders, and entrepreneurs in the future. This episode is sponsored by Acquire.com. More on that later. Now here is Mike. Michael, do you think generative AI will one day be as ubiquitous as concepts like databases or emails, like these things that are all around us all the time? Will generative AI be that for us as well? I, I think there'll be an interim period where it is. Um, although I, I suspect a lot of those old abstractions will become irrelevant. Um, uh, like, it, like we might not care about databases or something one day. Uh, like the thing <laughs> I, I think about is... Um, uh, I read an article about um, how kids these days don't understand file systems uh, because they grew up with Google Drive. And in Google Drive, uh, you could just search. And because the search is so good, they never organize stuff into fo folders. Um, uh, so that's really surprising to me, right? Like uh, as a child of the you know 80s and 90s, and I, uh, you know, I, I meticulously organize stuff. But um, it kind of really made me think because. Uh, I mean, you, I don't know if you've used um, object storage and stuff with the, the startup that you're building, but like even in uh, Google um, Cloud Storage, uh, there is no real file system. It's just blobs. And then the folders are just like, if you give it a name with a forward slash and then a folder name and then a forward slash, then then it calls it a folder, right? It displays it as a folder, but it's not how it is actually stored. It's not actually in that folder, if that makes sense. That's such an interesting point. It's like the, the new technology actually acts like the old thing that us old people know, like how, yeah. it, how it used to work. <laughs> yeah, that, that, wasn't that like, uh, an article in Hacker News about this just a couple of weeks ago? Like AWS is not a file system, right? Like that, that mm, was yeah, out there yeah. too, where it's, it's really just blob storage and it, it's meticulously secured with checksums and everything, but there is no file structure. It's just It's just set on top. That's an interesting point. I guess if you only have a mobile phone, and you don't really have anything comparable to like the, the the Windows Explorer or Mac Mac OS Finder or something like this. Like you never actually have to deal with files in the context of just them being filed files somewhere. You always interact with them as data in an application. Okay, that's interesting. So, w what will we see in, in that regard with with AI tools? Like, what steps will they take away that we take for granted right now? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, nobody knows <laughs> is the short answer, but, um, if I was like venturing to guess, uh, based on like, I, I always like to say, um, I, I can't remember who said this originally, uh, but, um, they said like, if you, uh, you should live in the future and build what's missing, right? Um, I think it was Paul Graham, uh, in one of his essays. Uh, so, um, so, uh, you know, when I talk to people about the prompt engineering stuff that I'm doing, uh, they're like, Oh, you're living in the future, man. You know, like it's kind of crazy what you're, what, what you're doing right now. Um, and, uh, and, and so like, if I kind of take, my own life as to the abstractions that I care about um, with AI um, and, and like what I'm, what I've abandoned now, I guess, since AI is doing most of my work <laughs> is um, I don't really care about code very much anymore. Um, uh, so, so like I used to work in data science, I actually used to manage a team of data scientists and um, I cared very much about like how the code is written and what the results were and and like we'd step through you know line by line uh, but now i find quite often i'm just like asking chat gbt it's writing some code i'm not even looking at the code it's writing and it gives me the answer and i you know check that answer and i think yeah that matches my intuition but uh ultimately that code is like written for one purpose and is never looked at again and i suspect that that's going to keep expanding right so that's what data analysis is already pretty good at that but I've seen some demos from people like Next.js, I think is pretty for, forward thinking on this, like for Vercel, the team of Vercel. Um, they, uh, they're, they're like building one time use UIs, right? So when the, the if you're chatting to ChatGPT, it builds a UI, right? If this, this, you can imagine this, uh, it would build a form that's just related to that query. Um, and then it throws it away. So I, I feel like a lot of code is going to be thrown away and won't be seen as like an asset so much anymore. Like right now it's like, I have a good, really good code base and I need to make sure nobody steals it because uh, that's how I'm going to raise money with investors. And, and I don't think that, I think a lot of the value of uh, code as an asset uh, will, will be stripped away. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's part of I think the the underlying thread that a lot of developers feel that that part of their 
the job, like the creation of code, the writing, the actual authorship, like penmanship of code is going to be taken away. But I, I kind of also have the feeling that with that comes something else that does, did not exist before, which is kind of the, the wrangling of the code, right? You become more of like a, like an AI cowboy where you just kind of keep listing <laughs> it back into place. Yeah. In, instead of being, being the, the person like actually like herding the specific animals to really drive this metaphor into the ground. But you know what I mean, right? It's, it's like uh, the job changes there. Have, have you seen um, things happen in your interaction with those AIs, with code in particular, that you never thought you, you had to do before? Because I certainly have in building my new product. Like This is like an 80% code generated by AI that I just kind of try and make fit into an existing system. Do you experience the same? It's like working with a petulant child. Sometimes you know <laughs> you're trying to like um, you're, you're you're like writing uh, you you write this amazing prompt and um, you're like you know you try it a few times locally and it's like yeah this seems to be getting me the results I need uh, and then you run it like a thousand times and you're like huh like. Every, like, one in every hundred times, it just refuses to do the task, right? Um, and I'm like, there's no, there's no rhyme, no reason why. Uh, like, it's the same task, right? So, um, yeah, that, that, that is, I think, uh, it really changes the way you have to think about writing code and actually brings it closer to, like, I, I, I came into coding later in life. Like, I, I actually built and uh, ran a marketing agency. So, you know, when I was managing that team, I had like 50 people. Uh, you know, when, when you're managing 50 people, it's, you know, there's 30 days in the month. So uh, it's at least one person's like worst day of the month, like every day, right? <laughs> um, so like, if you're just an employee, like you have one bad day a month, two bad days a month, whatever, and the rest of the days are fine. If you're like managing a team of people, uh, there's always someone's bad day <laughs> happening that day. And you, you're you the one that kind of it filters up to. Um, and, and I kind of feel like that's the same with when I'm managing models, right? Like um, it's actually closer to being a manager of people than it is to being a software developer. That's very interesting. Man, I, I love the analogy with the bad day because I have the feeling, particularly as we are living in this rapidly evolving world where models come out with new versions like on a daily basis. If, if you go to Hugging Face just to look at the most recently updated models, like you will find hundreds, if not thousands of models that have been updated in the version just today, right? And some yes, of them yeah. are the big ones <laughs> that a lot of people use. So it feels like the, the bad day for a model is not just a bad day, it's a bad version de de deployed on a certain day as well right like there's you have to all, all of a sudden judge is this good or is this not and i honestly i struggle with this because i use several um of these models locally like my for me i don't necessarily deploy them to the cloud i run them on gpu instances in like i don't know lambda labs or aws just some like instances of a vm with a gpu attached and boy is it hard to wrangle these things to get them to do what you want them to do reliably it's what you said they sometimes just flat out refuse for no apparent reason the black box is a big issue for me um how how do you deal with this because i know you do a lot of prompt engineering that is uh the big topic that i really want to dive into with you today because it's something that i do every day it's I, everybody does it like every software engineer is trying to figure out how to get ai to do their bidding how do you deal with the fact that you have no insight into these models other than what comes out of them? You, you don't really know their inner workings. Now, how does this affect how you approach talking to them? Yeah, I, I think you have to kind of approach it more like um, a researcher studying human behavior in a way. Uh, you know, you have to kind of um, kind of observe what's happening in different um, extreme cases, um, and then uh, and then and then you start to form a pattern of like, okay, um, you know. Five times out of ten, it says, um, you know, it, it refuses. But uh, obviously, each time it refuses might be different because there's some non-determinism there, right? There's some randomness in the responses. Um, so you have to kind of go through and notice that pattern. And it's the same way that, um, you know, if someone was doing research of, uh, you know, a tribe in the Amazon, right? Like, <laughs> and they're trying to figure out how these people um, uh, communicate, uh, how what the structure is of the tribe, like how 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 they behave in certain situations. Uh, that's what they would do, right? Like, they would. You know, maybe record a lot of footage or they would, um, you know, record a lot of transcripts and then go through the transcripts meticulously and go, okay, well, you know, I, I've noticed like 10% of the time this phenomenon happens. And like, you know, in these cases, like this is likely to happen. Uh, so you're really kind of doing research into this new creature, <laughs> you know, this, this new form of intelligence that, um, you know, is even weirder than, uh, you know, an unc uncontacted tribe because you've never, like, it's like, you know, they're human, they're just like us. <laughs> uh, and this is like a simulation of a human. It's not, you know, not quite behaving the same way that we do.
Yeah, it's it's funny. I thought our first encounter with aliens would look different, but this is what it is, <laughs> right? Like we are literally seeing a new form of life for the lack of a better term because obviously it's not an organic life and it's not Yeah, it's not it's not real life. It's just you know? a, you know, it's a very good simulation of of uh of how a human responds, right? You know, <laughs> The, the term real here is something that I, as a, as an avid fan of science fiction, like I've been a, a Star Trek fan for all of my life and I've read a lot of like hard sci-fi and that kind of stuff. And like, yeah, I'm just, I just love the idea of like, what if, right? That's, that's what this is about. I, I couldn't tell you if this is alive or not. And the whole debate around AGI and, and, and Q star put aside, right? All of these, these terms that, uh, are very academic, like, there is a feeling here that there, there's something in these systems, even in, in the most basic, like 1.3 billion parameter trained, tiny 500 megabyte LLM systems that is just in, inescapably different from how technology used to be. Like there's something in there that creates something out of nothing, even though we kind of know how these networks work, how these models work. To me, that could well be understood as, as consciousness a couple hundred years from now. You know, like how we, in retrospect, always figure out, oh, things have been a certain way, we just didn't see it. Kind of feels like AI is at a stage where this, in a couple decades, is clearly something different than what we perceive it as right now. Do you feel the same? Do you feel this is like, I suspect you know, like on, that, this, yeah. on, this, on the verge? Yeah, I suspect that. I, I mean, um, fundamentally, like, I, I don't care that much about, like, the theoretical uh, question is, like, is this life or, you know, um, but I mean, it's pretty clearly not right now, right? But, but like, you, it could uh, get to the point where I suspect we would have to treat AI with more respect. <laughs> um, like I always say, please and thank you to ChatGPT. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, me um, too. Me too. Yeah, but, but, um, but you no, know, I, I suspect that um, eventually it might get to that point where you have like AI rights or, you know, like, uh, because um, ultimately like if it, if it simulates life very closely, is there like that much of a difference? Um, you know, just in the same way that, you know, you can have real emotion when you're playing a video game, which is just a simulation. Um, and, uh, and some people actually prefer playing video games to uh, playing reality. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, like it's, uh, I, I, I suspect that the question won't really matter that much. The theoretical question, what will really matter is how people behave around AI and, and how we, you know, form as a society different uh, kind of norms around uh, how to work with AI. I think like that's going to be the important th shift that happens. That's yeah, it, it goes both ways, right? Like you have ethics for how you treat AI, like as the potential life or consciousness that it could be, but you also have ethics in what you do with AI, like the the work that you create, the work that you let it create. And I think the the biggest debate over the last couple of weeks was around uh, Google's uh, the, the Gamma thing and the, the misrepresentation of historical visualizations and that was a big deal and the question was well is it ethical to misrepresent history or is it eth ethical to ask for things that the AI does not want to do or is trained to decline like where where do we draw the line? Because I, I think a, a lot of the visual AI has the obvious problems with you know pornography or with uh, things themes that that are deemed socially unacceptable yeah. How how does the prompt engineering play into this? Because I know people have been trying to effectively jailbreak these systems <laughs> and get what they want out of it. Like, how, how do you deal with this? As somebody who is teaching people how to prompt engineer, how do you deal with this ethical implication there? Yeah, I I, I don't know if I just um, I'm attracted to these uh, fields for some reason, uh, but but like I, we had the same problem in growth hacking. So my my agency that I built yeah, was a growth oh, hacking sure. agency, right? And um, I was interested in growth hacking because it was like this is what happens when you get a developer and you force them to work on marketing, you know, um, yeah. and then yeah, the magic right. happens, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like they they squirm for a bit, but eventually they produce magic. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, but then because um, there are a lot of marketers who are like, huh, if I like you know do a boot camp or like I learned a little bit of JavaScript, I can like say I'm a growth hacker and then I can get paid like a developer. Um, and, uh, and then what they really ended up doing was like spamming everyone's contact uh, address books, you know? Um, and, and so the growth hacking ended up being uh, associated with a lot of spam and like bad behavior, uh, trying to get something for nothing. Like the word hacking obviously didn't help there, uh, but uh, it's, it's a similar problem in prompt engineering where, 
um, you know, you get mixed reactions from people when you say oh, I'm a prompt engineer, um, because um, what I mean by prompt engineering is uh, someone who works with AI to build a system uh, to get useful and reliable outputs, right? Um, and so it's just like uh, if you're engineering a bridge, you want the bridge to be reliable, like you don't want it to suddenly turn to jelly, right? <laughs> um, so so, so you, you, know, you need to kind of understand a little bit about how bridges work, how physics works, you know, in order to um, make sure that the process of building those bridges is reliable and will get the same results every time. Um, and, and, you know, people don't get in trouble. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I prompt engineering is, is like that to me. Like if you're building a production system like you have with your app, um, you know, you just need to make sure it's reliable. You can't have it refuse to do a request every now and again, right? Or you can't have it like um, hallucinate and make make something up uh, that like you, with your tool, like it might say that something was said in the podcast that wasn't, and that could actually cause a big trouble. Um, yeah, a lot of trouble for uh, for some guests, right? Um, so I, uh, that's how I see prompt engineering, but um, how a lot of people see it is like these spammy, like here are like 800 of the best prompts uh, uh, for, for this. And I'm like, okay, you look through it and it's, it, it looks like someone casting a spell, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like an incantation. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's how you know it's a lot of crap. You know? <laughs> yeah. Honestly, that's, that's exactly how I feel about most of, um, of this, this whole AI world in many ways, it has some kind of sense of yeah. wizardry to it, right? It feels magical. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it is, it is, it is kind of an incantation. It is, you, you, you evoke a result by just telling something what to do, but you really, you use the right words in the right order and you have a, a swoosh and yeah. flick to use the, <laughs> the Harry Potter methodology, right? There, there is, there is something about, um, ca casting a spell that, that a lot of prompt engineering looks like to the uninitiated. Obviously, once you look into it, you understand how, you know, the tokens work and how context works and, and how even you can dive into embeddings and all these things where, how the data gets ingested, but it, it feels, Magical. What I I wanna wanna talk, get get back to you mentioning the bridge because like civil engineering and architecture has a lot of certification to make sure that people don't build bridges that turn into jelly. Do you think um, prompt engineering in the world of like AI education in particular would benefit from such such kind of a certification, or do you feel that it's still like the wild west and we'll see where this goes right now? Yeah, good question. I, I mean, um, I would say it depends on what you're using it for. I think I think. Um, you know, there, there probably needs to be some sort of university degree in um, AI, right, or prompt engineering, like a, an actual one, like in the same way that, you know, if you go to university uh, to become an engineer, then you get trusted a little bit more uh, with, with these sorts of problems. Uh, but I would say that, um, you know, each industry, each application um, is different. And um, if you regulate uh, the, you know, like prompt engineering as a field, um, then I think you're going to have a lot less innovation in the fields where like you should be able to just mess around. Um, e equally, I suspect that, um, you know, even like bridge engineering <laughs> would be civil engineering would, would, would benefit a little bit from uh, more risk taking um, in, in the testing phase. Um, just like, you know, uh, actually, I'm wearing a SpaceX T-shirt, so it kind of looks makes me look like a Elon fanboy. But um, but you know, <laughs> like uh, he blew up a lot of rockets, right? <laughs> um, and and you know, uh, like obviously he has uh, smart people on the team who are all qualified engineers. But um, but but I uh, you know I think prompt engineering works best when it's like that. You you're just really testing the limits of the model. You're testing like weird things. Um, and, and then in production, you want to be really safe. But, but I, I, you know, when, when you put humans on board the rocket, you want it to be really safe. But the way that you create safety is by having an, like almost like unregulated, crazy amount of testing um, of like really creative ideas. Um, so, so I think you have to kind of decide what stage you're at in the product as well. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, the, the problem right now to, to me is that there is such an, an incredible pace in development speed and also in, in the best sense, I guess, an incredibly accessibility to all these things. Like everybody can prompt engineer. It's not that like the current version of like Llama 2 or Llama 3 or, you know, GPT-4, GPT-5 is like hidden behind some kind of like academic wall and only certified prompt engineers can, you know, figure stuff out. Like everybody can either run these models themselves locally or at least use a fairly reasonably priced API to access them. Everybody can use it. 
And I guess with tools that are ever more interconnected, also able to like execute functions and, you know, lookups on the internet and even, you know, ev evoke other services. Again, there's this magical thing where the thing that I tell to do something actually calls somebody and does something for me. How weird is that? Right. There's, there's a lot of risk in it overstepping boundaries or again, unethical behavior. So I think the, the pace of stuff just makes it so hard to, to even, it, it, you know, like even tier this, like there's a development tier, there's a testing tier, a QA tier, a stage tier, a production tier. That's how we do software. But for these models, it feels like they're all in the same happening at the same time. Do you see that too? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I would say that there is uh, usually um, distinct phases in the projects I'm working on. Uh, so uh, typically you would start with, you know, the, uh, like if I work with a client or if even if it's just me doing it myself, you start in, in, in ChatGPT or in the playground uh, and you're messing around with the prompt. You'd have a problem. You think, I wonder if AI can do this. Right. Um, and then you're like, oh, it actually does a pretty good job. But there's some problems. Uh, so you start to note down the problems. You make changes to the prompt. And there's this trial and error phase. Right. Um, and um, if you keep going on trial and error, I think that's when you get to these incantations because uh, you I, maybe I think after you've been working on that problem for too long and you've seen too many versions of the same thing, you start to get weird, and uh, <laughs> you know that's when you start casting spells. Um, uh, but but um, I, I think I think you quickly need to move out of that phase once it's working okay into a more rigorous like optimization phase. And the difference between those two things is um, when you're doing trial and error with ChatGPT. Um, or with you know an image model like Dali, uh, you um, uh, you you're, you have a tendency to overextend the prompt, um, and you also have a tendency to make changes that aren't really improving the performance. Uh, like they just kind of look like they are because you got a lucky hit, right? Um, and it's very similar actually to like the early days of medicine where they would, you know, they would uh, <laughs> they're kind of looping this back to incantations. You know, they would be like, oh, he needs to, we need to balance his humors. So we'll bleed some, yes, uh, you know, his left arm. And, so, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and it's like the reason those things exist is because of, uh, you know, people mistaking correlation for causation um, or they, they, you know, they, they like it happened and it worked once. So then they keep doing it, even though they, they never actually tested whether it continues to work. Right. Um, so, uh, so I think you need to get more scientific with something that's going to be in production. And that could be as simple as, you know, just running that prompt like uh, 30 times um, and then pasting it into uh, Google doc. Right. Um, and, and then just reviewing like, okay, like how often does it do bad things? Like, you know, what, like what, what types of groups of bad things does it do? Um, and then you get uh, more of an understanding. Like when I'm doing prompt engineering, I'm like in a Jupyter notebook, like writing Python and I'll, like, uh, with my function that calls ChatGPT, it won't just call it once, it'll call it a hundred times. Um, and it'll do it asynchronously. So instead of going like call ChatGPT and then it give, gives me back the answer, then call ChatGPT gives me the answer. Um, instead, it will call like a hundred times at once and then you get like a hundred answers back at once. So it's a lot faster. Um, otherwise it would take hours. Um, and then, uh, and then I have like some automated evaluation as well. So if I'm trying to like make a blog post longer, uh, uh, you know, because right now, uh, when you ask it to generate a long blog post, it will write at most 800 words. Um, if I'm trying to find different ways to improve that, I'll do it systematically. So I'll test, you know, version A 100 times, version B 100 times, um, and then I'll see if there's actually any aggregate difference. Um, I think that that's when you get into real engineering, um, separate from uh, like this witchcraft stuff. I, I love this because that's exactly what I've been doing over the last couple of days. I've been um, for, for Podscan. I have this question answering thing, right, where where uh, my my users can ask a specific question of every podcast that is out there, and if it triggers, if it's answered with yes or no, and if it's yes, then they get a notification. That's the general idea. That's how I use inference and AI on my system, right? It, it looks for keywords, and if it finds any keyword, it checks. Well, is it actually answering this question with yes or no? But for that. I needed a system that can reliably and truthfully answer yes or no to any question. And that turned out to be quite complicated because like a, a lot of systems out there, even ChatGPT is, is pretty good at, at saying yes or no, but sometimes it just answers with maybe or with mm, probably or something like this, right? It's, <laughs> it's hard to quantify words like that if you expect a yes or no. So I needed to find a specific model that was uh, useful for question answering. Like I, I'm using, I think, the Falcor model, which is a, a 
a specific QA trained model. And then I needed to figure out what is the right prompt. And all these models have very different styles of prompt. It's not just that you write a text. Sometimes they're trained on certain formats, right? Where it says like bot says this and then user says and then you, you get the response or sometimes you have the LM starts, the, the LM uh, system tags or these things. They're all very specific and it took me ages to figure out a good prompt that is reliable and answers in, in a way that does not answer, like it does not give false positives, but it, it can answer wrong. Like yeah, I don't want it to say yes to something that is a no, but it's fine for me to, for it to say no to something that, that might be a yes. I don't care about the, the false negatives that those are acceptable because I have like 20,000 podcast episodes coming in in a day. It's fine if one or two are not mentioned, but the false positive is a problem. So I set up a system in Python, not in a Jupyter notebook, just in a Python script where it just consists runs this local AI on, I think, a hundred like text fragments plus a question and an answer, yes or no. And then it just consistently checks. And I, I've run this, I think it has been running for two days straight. I think it ran over like 30,000 times at this point. And I, I got it to a point with, you know, playing with the prompt where it has like 99.8 or something percent accuracy, which... It's bizarre because I never expected to do this kind of research work by building something that scans podcasts. It's bizarre, but you kind of have to do it, right? This, this is how you, you have to optimize these models. Yeah, for sure. Like, and, and, um, what you're doing there, like, uh, the, the keyword, uh, for anyone like interested in looking more into this is evals. Um, uh, that's what all the AI people call it, right? Evaluations. Um, so like when OpenAI releases a new model, uh, they'll have like these benchmarks of, um, you know, different sets of questions and answers that, uh, they're kind of like different tests that the AI can take, right? Um, and, uh, you know, some of them measure reasoning ability. So they have a load of question answering reasoning, um, uh, yeah, you know, type, type, um, uh, sets. And then, and then you'll have like some that measure ma uh, mathematical ability, that others that measure like grammar and English, uh, literature. Uh, you have some that measure uh, ability to do other languages. So for example, if you have your podcasts that are, um, you know, in other languages, you could translate them, right? Um, uh, if that becomes important. So. Um, yeah, uh, typically, you know, I'm custom building them every time <laughs> for my clients because it doesn't really matter to my client, like, if it's good at reasoning. It just matters, like, can it do this specific, uh, task, right? Um, and, uh, and it's just like recruiting, right? Like, you know, in the job interview, you want to kind of figure out, <laughs> you know, can they, like, can they use Excel? Like, can they do this? You know, how good are they at doing this? And, um, you know, and, and sometimes you have to, you know, recruit a model that uh, isn't very good at that yet and fine tune it, like train it. And just like you would train a, uh, an employee. I, I love the fact that I think this is like the fifth time you've kind of compared working with AIs to working with people. I, I think like as agents, I mean, that's what they are, right? They are agents of our intention and they, they tend to have, be able to make some kind of decision, conscious or not, right? In, in our stead. So I, I love this comparison that, that is really cool. And yes, you, you definitely have to evaluate them. Well, one thing that comes to mind is overfitting because these benchmarks are also quite public, right? What prevents AI systems from kind of including these benchmarks in their training system and then acing them? Um, is that a problem? Because I, I don't know that that part of the space too well. Is is this an issue? It, it is. It is actually like um, uh, I mean I, I I don't I'm not involved too much in like the public benchmarks so much, but um, because I, like I, I just look at like okay, uh, if someone tells me that this new model is good, uh, then I'll try it for myself and see if it works for my tasks, right? But um, but ultimately um, uh, you know a lot of those benchmarks are becoming meaningless in some respects. Um, for a couple of reasons, right? One is that there's probably some bad behavior going on where, um, you know, people are intentionally overfitting on the exam questions. Um, like, uh, you know, so that, that's, um, that's just one thing. I, I would like to think that's relatively rare because I think a lot of the people who work, work in these AI research labs are relatively ethical, thankfully. Um, but, um, I, I would also suspect that, um, uh, they're doing a, a wide scale unintentionally. Um, so, I'll give you an example, like a uh, GPT-4 can pass the bar exam, you know, um, it's pretty smart, right? Um, but um, uh, if you give it novel legal questions, um, it, it fails really badly. Uh, so if it's, if it's in the training data, uh, like if you think about it, the bar exam is uh, a question and answer set. Uh, it's an eval for humans um, and it's based on the training data for those humans, right? I, like they have to have read certain cases in, in, in Harvard Law School um, and uh, in order to answer those questions. And GPT-4 has read those cases too. 
um, and it can has perfect recall. So um, I, I, I like uh, sometimes those benchmarks are not um, really uh, testing the ability of the AI um, more so than like testing the quality of the data set they were trained on. Um, and then I think the third thing is um, a lot of these models are not just you know a one shot prompt model. Uh, these days, or zero shot prompt model, like it's not just like you type a question, and you get an answer back. There's a lot of like stuff happening in the background. So, um, you know, when you ask, um, you know, ChatGPT to write some code for you, um, it actually in the back end comes up. It, it, it's it's multiple calls to the model. Like the first call will make a plan of like what needs to be written, um, and then the second call will then go and like write the code. Um, if that makes sense. And then it has another call where it can run the code and it, it passes an error message back to itself. Uh, and it says, oh, I had, had an error, sorry. And then it will attempt to fix it, right? So um, it's one call for you, but it's actually like multiple calls in the back end. Um, and, uh, and, and the one that I recall recently that was interesting was uh, Google's model by default can search the web. Uh, so if you're testing Google's model on any question, if that answer is online in, in anywhere, any way, shape or form, like you're like giving Google an open book exam, right? So Gemini's scores are massively inflated because it can go search the answer. It's not having to like look back in its training data, if that makes sense. Huh. It's like cheating the test, but in a good way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but just like, um, you know, just like school versus work, like a lot of the behavior that would get you thrown out of school would actually get you promoted at work. So, um, you know, like you should go and cheat on the test, right? Like if you can, um, if you're, if you're employed or, or if it's your own company in particular. I, I I like what you said about the bar exam, where the the exam is really just test test on how well people study the, the the data, the underlying training data. And I think that the interesting part here will be how can we reliably create tests that kind of test that, but are also novel enough to see where the limitations of these systems are, right? And I wonder if this is going to be kind of almost a self cannibalizing thing, where AIs are built or LLM systems are built to generate similar yet unique questions or or you know t test data sets for other AIs to be tested on, or maybe this is going to be something that people will always have to do. It's always going to be a human ingenuity thing. Do you, you think this? But where do you think this might go? Which direction might this go? Yeah, do you know, I, I think there's going to be a couple of uh, things that will happen. So one is uh, benchmarks overall will become less important as they just get beaten all the time. And uh, I, I don't think we'll come up with better benchmarks necessarily, right? Like that will that will, that will end in a few years, I think, um, or become less relevant. Like it'll be in the paper that they publish, but it won't be something that, you know, average people talk about. Um, uh, I think it's really just important when we were making a lot of rapid progress in AI and um, AI was, you know, it was really important that like it got like 10% better at reasoning, right? Um, and especially if it becomes the new state of the art. But like pretty soon these models are going to get to the point where they surpass like the abilities needed to do most of the tasks that we need them to do. Um, and at which point uh, you'll just kind of use the one you like, I guess, so similar to, um, I'm going back to humans as well, but like, um, you know, if, if you could hire, um, you know, a bunch of people from Harvard or Oxford or, you know, an elite university um, of that level of intelligence, um, uh, like, you know, if they're already intelligent enough to do the job, the important thing is like, do you want to spend eight hours with them every day? <laughs> uh, so I think the personality of the model will, will start to make a difference. And therefore, like, there'll be, tr it'll be become very tribal. Like, there'll be people who love like ChatGPT type model. There'll be people who love like Claude from Anthropic. I, I already see that actually happening. Claude has like a little bit more personality than ChatGPT. So I've seen people saying, oh, even though Claude is wor slightly worse, uh, and some things, um, I prefer Claude and I'm going to use Claude from now on. Um, and, and people will also go tribal around the companies as well. Like there'll be the Microsoft camp, there'll be the Google camp, there'll be, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I suspect it'll come down more to personal preference. Um, and, and then I think the other thing is, um, the real test is going to be like how well they perform in the real world, um, or in virtual worlds. Uh, so, you know, for example, like, the test of whether Tesla's, you know, self-driving car is doing a good job is how many times the driver has to intervene. Um, and, and there's it, it basically impossible to fake that test, right? <laughs> um, you know, so, so like if the driver feels unsafe enough to intervene, then that's a failure, right? Uh, um, and, and, and the, the more they can eradicate that, like, um, then, then, you know, the, the better the AI is doing, right? That's the real benchmark. 
Um, you know, and, and in order to get there, uh, they, you know, didn't just test, you know, didn't just let loose a self-driving car, right? Like, um, and, and crash into the wall because, <laughs> you know, it needs tons of data to be able to uh, be good enough. Um, what they did is they slowly automated different parts of the driving experience. Like, uh, that some things are easier than others. Um, they also did a lot of testing in a virtual world. So. They have their own version of Grand Theft Auto. You can think about this, um, where you, you know, the car can drive around, uh, but the car can drive around 30,000 times a day, right? Like, you know, it's, um, there's no limitation in the simulation, um, but the simulation obeys the rules of physics. So at the very least, the model learns how to obey the rules of physics and it knows, okay, if I steer too hard to the right, I'm going to hit the wall. Um, and, and then, then it's kind of ready for real world. Um, behavior. So, so I suspect there's going to be a lot more stuff like that where I've seen models, you know, people have got them to play Minecraft. Um, uh, and like, and that's a really good test for agentic behavior. Like, can it make decisions, um, you know, about what to do next? And, um, you know, I, I've seen people uh, say that the real test of a model is going to be, um, can you just say, go make me money online? <laughs> and if it does, <laughs> then, then it's, then it's succeeded. Uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, but then you get into the ethics of like, uh, whether that's a good thing or not. Um, yeah. So uh, have you seen, uh, Devin, but uh, in, in that line, have you seen Devin, the, uh, the new like developer agent that has yeah. been doing jobs and Upwork and all this stuff? Like what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Devin, Devin has been interesting, like for, for two reasons. Obviously, the technology is very interesting, and for certain things like write unit tests for my code base, that is perfect. <laughs> He's like, okay, mm, sure, go ahead, yeah. <laughs> do the thing. Um, the, the technology is as it is so rapidly evolving. I, I, I don't feel threatened by it. I feel kind of empowered by it to know that there's something that will take away these things that I would have to either spend a lot of time on myself or figure out how to hire somebody or whatever, right? It's, it's nice to, to see technology take over that part of technology creation as well. The interesting part for me has been the reaction in the community, which has been split along this line as well. The community is either, Oh no, we're going to take our jobs, right? We were going to lose everything we have where developers aren't worth anything anymore. You should never learn how to code. Like people have been saying this for some reason like don't learn how to code machines are going to do it anyway which which is i I, honestly in my opinion is just as reductive as saying you shouldn't learn how to read or write when you have audiobooks like it doesn't make any sense right (laughs) the the, the capacity to think the the capacity to structure thought to architect solutions to a problem that's what coding is code the writing part is irrelevant and so i i guess you know, you should still learn how to code and how to think and how to express uh, instructions to something. That is effectively what prompt engineering is in a way too. It's coding, but on a different cognitive level. And the other side is just very open of this conversation. It's like, great, some another agent for, for me to not have to do the work that I don't like doing. I like to conceptualize. I like to make money online. I don't want to implement that that blog. I don't want to implement that affiliate system. Let that thing do it. And it feels like, do we see it as a threat or as a tool? It's like, you know, this is the, the ever-present debate about weapons, right? Is a kitchen knife a, a murder weapon or is it a tool to make food? Yes, it's the answer. And I think yes. in, in <laughs> Devin is exactly the same. Yes, Devin's answer is yes. <laughs> like, whatever it is, it's yes. So how do you feel about this? How do you feel about this from, from the prompt engineering side? Yeah, I had a little bit of a taste of this where I um I was doing a, a ton of prompt writing and then I um I, I did I, I I was actually gonna I was working on a uh, different book that not not the one uh, that that's coming out in June uh, for O'Reilly but but I was working on a different one for a different publisher which I, I would say but I started working on it was going to be a big collection of prompts um so exactly like the incantations that uh, that I was uh, <laughs> railing against before but uh, my plan was to make it more scientific and kind of show some actual test results for each prompt right so it was going to be like two hundred prompts and uh, what I found is uh, I, I got really tired of doing it uh, and I was like maybe I could could maybe maybe GPT four can write prompts, um, and uh, and it would it it was great. It was actually really good um, uh, to the point where like I couldn't be bothered to write prompts anymore because um, uh, I was like, huh, it's, it's actually pretty good. So, but then I was thinking, what have I done? Like I, you know, I, I, I've been charging hard to like automate everyone else's job, and I've just uh, accidentally automated my job. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but the funny thing is, like, it's you know, it, it's now at the point where like. Um, you know, I, I am, I, I'm using that to kind of get a good baseline, but then 
uh, the really powerful prompts are the ones where like, I have some knowledge that's like not in the training data. Um, and I have some like opinion or preference that like the average person doesn't have. And like, I, I put that in the prompt and then you don't really need to care about like the rest of the formatting and stuff like that. Yeah. That's kind of basic, like that's boilerplate. Right. Um, and, and let the, you know, let Devin do the boilerplate, right. <laughs> let GPT-4 do the boilerplate for you. Um, uh, and then you can do the stuff that you actually care about and you enjoy. Yeah, that's that's kind of uh, in in many ways. I think this discussion goes way beyond tech. This goes into you know universal basic income and the capacity to to freely live a life full of meaning and all that. But even in in the conf- confines of like the AI world and and prompting and and LLMs, it feels like yeah, machines should do the baseline stuff. The foundational work should be done by the automatable systems or the systems that have much more capacity to work through this than we as humans. It's like the the thing you do or that we both do. In, in testing our data. We don't sit there and get the result from ChatGPT, then we check it, and then the next one goes out, and then we check it. Like We send them out in bulk, they come in bulk, we do an evaluation on them, and then we look at the data, and then we dive into the specifics. Right? I, in, in my case, I look at the thing that always gets answered wrong, and then I try to figure out, well, how can I change this number here for this specific thing to go up or down? Right? That's that's where we are good. We are we're good at spotting things that need to be done that a machine would never see. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like people are going to end up doing a lot more primary research. Um, like starting a startup or being an indie hacker will be, I think, much more about like carving off a specific niche of like, uh, all the problems left in the world and like, you know, actually going and running experiments to figure it out. Um, because, um, I think that that's something we have a really strong capacity for. Like I, I found this with my content writing as well. Cause I, went for a period of like doing a lot of content writing and like my marketing agency, we, we grew like 60% of our leads came from our blog. So it was really big for us. Um, I'm terrible at networking, but I was good at writing. So kind of substituted. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, you know, I was writing a lot like professionally and then, uh, and actually it was a big part of my identity. Like people knew me for it. Right. And then I went through a phase of doing everything through chat GPT. Um, like when GPT four came out, uh, it was, or like I had already automated a lot with GPT-3 and then GPT-4 was so much better. So I was like, okay, uh, why do I need to write anything anymore? Um, and now uh, I've become right. Uh, I've started writing again. Um, and, and my writing is so much better because uh, what I'm doing is I'll go to chat GPT and I'll ask it to write something on the topic that I'm interested in. And then I'll like look for holes and I'll go, no, it's wrong about this. I'm pretty sure it's wrong about this, right? I need some proof, but but I'm pretty sure that like this is not correct. So I'll go and run an experiment or I'll go collect some data and I'll I'll do the actual research and then I will write it up, right? And um and and I think it's like pushing me to be a better writer now. I went through this weird phase where I just stopped writing and lost all hope, but now I'm like back into it and and uh, I'm enjoying it more than I ever would because I'm not like writing the boring stuff that you would have to write for SEO anymore. You know, like ChatGPT can kind of do that stuff. But, um, you know, now I'm writing the stuff where I'm like, I'm going out and finding something new about the world. And then I'm becoming the training data for the next version of ChatGPT. Uh, you know, yeah, I think like, you right. want to, yeah, if, if you can, if you can be in the training data, um, more than you're using the training data, then I think that's a good <laughs> balance. You know, <laughs> I love that. Be the training data. That's something yeah. to strive towards, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> it makes, makes a lot of sense because you you're kind of you're on the edge of technology, right? You're al- you're already using like the latest technology if you deal with AI systems like this. So you might as well be the person that influences the next steps instead of being just the one that like takes uh, benefits, even though that is great from the past steps. That reminds me, you brought up the book, and I do want to talk about this. Like you've been writing a book about prompt engineering and, and generative AI, and that field is fast paced like i think over the last couple of weeks we've been presented with like just sora for that matter like a a model that i never expected to appear this quickly like video generation um how do you deal with this in writing a book about this how do you keep up with technology and all these new models and all these new things in a book that hopefully at some point is going to be an artifact in time do, do you even even do you, do you want to change that as well do you want to keep it updated all the time like how are you <laughs> going to deal with this in, in the yeah book? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the book publishing model will have to change in some respects. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I suspect what, what we'll probably do in the future. Um, and, and O'Reilly, I think are already like publicly talking about this sort of thing, right? Like, uh, they, uh, like well, as part of our contract we signed, um, they have like, they, they've like, optioned the right to like basically 
ingest our book into a chatbot, right? So people can talk to our book, right? Like, I don't think they're actually doing that yet, but, but like, it's something they've talked about doing at some point. And I, I, I'm sure all book publishers are thinking about this, right? You, and, and I, I imagine, like, you, you talked about sci-fi and I love sci-fi as well. I imagine the sci-fi of the future will be like, not like, you know, we have to wait for the next, uh, book in the series, but, but it will be like, uh, you know, they, they build a world. Um, and then, uh, and then you can query that world and maybe go on your own adventures yeah. in, in that world. Right. And you could like go that's deep so on, cool. on the specific topic. Right. I, I says, that's what I suspect will happen in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, in practical terms, how did we approach this for our book? So I have a, a co-author, uh, James Phoenix, uh, who I also work with on a, a few projects. And, um, so it, it definitely helped to like, not have like the whole weight of, uh, keeping up with everything in AI on my shoulders. Like he did a lot more of the Lang chain stuff. Um, and, and went deeper on the more technical aspects. Um, and I, I, you know, focused more on, you know, image generation, stable diffusion. Um, and, uh, and then also like the general principles of prompting, which the book is based on. And, um, and the way that we tried to, um, approach this was, um, you know, I started using AI in 2020. It was actually the year I left the agency and I, I got access to GPT-3. Uh, actually, first it was copy AI. And then I got, I was like, this is amazing. What does it use? Right. <laughs> and then I got access to GPT-3. Um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, I, I, what I found is when, when it went from GPT-3 to GPT-4, um, or 3.5 and then quickly four afterwards, uh, a lot of the old like tricks that we had to use, like the hacks we had to use to get the model to do anything useful, um, you know, didn't apply anymore. And what we're left were these kind of, I guess, like five general principles, um, that, um, we refined over time. So, um, I already had like a blog post on this, just like what led to the book deal. Um, but it made me, uh, it, because they're like general principles that still worked from GPT-3 to GPT-4, um, what I'm hoping is that like when they release GPT-5, they will still continue to work there, right? Um, and, and we, you know, th- I guess there's no coincidence that I keep referring to like managing GPTs as like managing humans because, um, what I noticed, like I studied business management and then, and went into, did a master's in economics. Um, and I noticed that like, Pretty much all of these principles are basically like business management principles. So, um, you know, one is give direction. Uh, so, you know, you would never hire a, uh, a human employee and then not give them a brief on the type of tasks that you want to do, right? You wouldn't hire an agency and say, um, you, know, you make up the marketing campaign. I don't care. You know, you would say, okay, here's the brief. Here's the kind of thing I'm looking for, right? Um, so that's like one of the, fir- that's the first principle. And then you specify the format. Like what, what do you want back in terms of like, do you want, um, you know, uh, a numbered list, an ordered list, or, or a paragraph of text. How many paragraphs of text do you want? Uh, or even if you're building a tool, like, do you want this back in JSON, uh, a structured data, so you can put it into a database or display it on a web page? Um, and then, uh, and then the third one is giving examples. So typically, like, if if a human is struggling to uh, do a task, you would just like, here are some examples of how this task has been done well in the past that I like. Um, and that gives them a real good sense because sometimes it's really hard to like explain exactly what you want. Uh, so if you find some good examples, um, it's maybe easier to infer the nuance of like, oh, I, I kind of want it like this. I get it now. Right? And and the same trick works for GPT. So, you know, I won't go through everything, but um, but yeah, like it, it struck me one day that like, oh, this is kind of like, you know, what I learned back in, you know, business management uh, school, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, so, so, so yeah, the, the, there are parallels there, yeah. The transfer of knowledge here is so impressive, right? That that first of the our capacity to do this uh, as people just shows you like what how cool this actually is that we can take these these wildly different principles and just apply them to something new. But it also shows just how similar AI agents and humans are, right? They 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 are able to do things if you explain them well, if you give them the the format, if you give them the examples, the intention and all that. That is um that is definitely helpful. It's cool. I, I love the fact that you're writing a book about this because I feel I, I love books. I love having a library of things to look things up and to be able to to just learn things from. I I know this is a changing field, but I think there the principles in this, underlying principles, will be valid for a long while. Like even just the ideas of embedding or of of you know text splitting and all these things to to feed them into models in different ways. 
and giving context, context windows, all of this. This will probably stick around for a while. And in our terms, a while might be two, three years. Who knows? But still, it's it's not going to be outdated immediately. The, the concepts of that work. You also have, and I I, uh, I learned this very recently, uh, a fairly successful Udemy course about this too, right? You you w- went multimodal with this uh, to, <laughs> course, to use yeah. the term, <laughs> and, and that one seems to have worked pretty well as well. Is is that um, the same ideas, the same contents, or how does that work? Yeah, good question. Uh, we, we get this, um, you know, we get this a lot actually because um, I had written this blog post on the principles of prompting, and um, they actually came about as just um, I was doing a lot of image generation stuff for this this first book that I was writing. Um, uh, the, this was like a self published book on on marketing, um, uh, and uh, you know, I was trying to do designs in mid gen version four, so it was really crappy <laughs> at the time. And I was, you know, I did a lot of prompt engineering to figure it out. Um, and then I wrote this, this, um, you know, this, this blog post and I kept updating it over the years. Uh, so then when, um, you know, when, when O'Reilly came knocking, uh, and they're like, Hey, would you like to publish a book? I'm like, yeah, of course. <laughs> so how I learned how to code was reading O'Reilly books, you know, um, it's pretty amazing. So, uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I jumped on that opportunity, but it, it did take like a few months, right, to, um, you know, n- like figure out, you know, go through the approvals and pitch the ideas and shape the, you know, table of contents. Uh, and then like, you know, also time to write it and then edit it, right? So, um, you know, AI doesn't uh, hang around <laughs> that long, um, uh, you know, and and I also have, we have, I was having a lot of really good ideas all the time. And um, so, uh, what we did was we we published this Udemy course, and it was based on the same principles, uh, but obviously because it's a different format and multimodal, as you said, um, you know it's it's very different from the blog post, and 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 uh, you know different again from the book as well. The book is much more in the vein of like an O'Reilly book where. Um, you know, it kind of uh, it explains these topics in a comprehensive way. Um, it has it goes deeper into like why it is the way it is. Um, whereas the Udemy course is much more of like a quick hit because that's what like what Udemy people want, right? Um, so the Udemy course is obviously in video format, so that appeals to different people. Um, but it's much more organized as like here are different like projects that you can do. So the the book is like lots of like practical tips and examples and theory. And then the last chapter is that one overarching project that brings everything together. Whereas the Udemy course is like five videos on the principles. Um, and then just like lots of like crazy stuff that we've done with AI. <laughs> so it's like very different in, in, you know, the same underlying theme. It's definitely, you know, the same authors, right? But, uh, but yeah, like very different use cases, very different target audiences. No, that, 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 that makes these things so interesting, right? Like people are very cerebral. They can read the book. They can go through everything and understand uh, like all the, the basics, the foundational, and then build on top of that, build the project. And some people just want to be inspired. They just want to see what can be done, right? It's, it's, it's really cool to see you offer this in, in multiple ways. Uh, it's a, it's an approach that I've used as well. And I really appreciate it. Well, that is really cool. Well, now I have an, another book to read <laughs> and another there course to take. So, all right. Yeah. So I guess, guess my weekend is, uh, is fully booked. Now, if people want to figure out where to learn more about this topic and learn more about you and the work that you do and the products you create and the knowledge that you share, where would you like them to go? Yeah, so, um, you know, the book is on the O'Reilly platform. Uh, you can get like a free trial. Uh, I think it's 10 days, uh, which, you know, should be enough to like skim and see if it's, it's useful for you. <laughs> um, uh, and, but it'll be in print. It's actually on pre-order on Amazon, uh, now. So it'll be in print in June, uh, hopefully, uh, if editing goes What's well. What's his full name? Um, yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, prompt, um, uh, so it's prompt engineering for generative AI. Um, and it's uh, Mike Taylor and James Phoenix, uh, the, the author. So, um, I also work with James on, uh, a company called VexPower, which is like an education uh, platform. Um, that's part of why we did the Udemy course, because we wanted to see how Udemy did it, you know, like <laughs> reverse engineer their success. Um, uh, but then the Udemy course blew up, right? So <laughs> it was like way more successful than our our, uh, our tech business. Um, uh, so so yeah, you can check that out as well. But um, but yeah, we, uh, we, we just set up a new company uh, we call Brightpool. Uh, it's brightpool.dev. Um, there's not really anything on the website right now. It's just a Notion page. But um, that's where we're going to start like putting random uh, interesting stuff we work on. So uh, we're building like a portfolio of different projects, kind of seeing which ones take off and, uh, you know, doing the indie hacking thing. Uh, you, you know how it is. So, that, that um, is yeah, awesome. That, that's what we're going to be doing. Yeah. 
Very cool. Well, I think I'm, I'm going to put all of these things in the show notes, in, including, I guess, your Twitter handle and everything else that, that you want to be fi- found at. And I really appreciate you talking to me about this. I, I, I burn for this topic right now. Like the, the presence of this in my day to day is incredible. Like I use chat GPT and all my local systems like for hours every day. And it's, it's nice to talk to somebody who really deeply understands this and who also has a, a, a methodical scientific approach to making sure that we get the the right results. I really appreciate you sharing all of these insights and your understanding of the space and where it might or might not go. It's really, really cool. And thanks again for making this connection between people and AI. I did not think about it like this before. I cannot I see myself not think about this in the future. Yeah. <laughs> I think that it's always going to be this from now on. It, it, yeah. it really is infectious. Man, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, you know, I've been a long time fan, so it's great to be amongst the the the, uh, the crowd now. You know, uh, I'm one of you guys now. And that's it for today. I will now briefly thank my sponsor, Acquire.com. Imagine this: you're a founder who's built a really solid SaaS product. You acquired all those customers, and everything is generating really consistent monthly recurring revenue. That's the dream of every SaaS founder, right? Problem is, you're not growing for whatever reason. Maybe it's lack of skill or lack of focus or lack of interest. You don't know. You just feel stuck in your business with your business. What should you do? Well, the story that I would like to hear is that you buckled down, you reignited the fire, and you started working on the business, not just in the business. And all those things you did, like audience building and marketing and sales and outreach, they really helped you to go down this road, six months down the road, making all that money. You tripled your revenue and you have this hyper successful business. That is the dream. The reality, unfortunately, is not as simple as this. And the situation that you might find yourself in is looking different for every single founder who is facing this crossroad. This problem is common, but it looks different every time. But what doesn't look different every time is the story that here it just ends up being one of inaction and stagnation because the business becomes less and less valuable over time and then eventually completely worthless if you don't do anything. So if you find yourself here already at this point or you think your story is likely headed down a similar road, I would consider a third option and that is selling your business on acquire.com because you capitalizing on the value of your time today is a pretty smart move. It's certainly better than not doing anything. And Acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already. Just go check it out at try.acquire.com slash Arvid, it's me, and see for yourself if this is the right option for you, your business at this time. You might just wanna wait a bit and see if it works out half a year from now or a year from now, just check it out. It's always good to be in the know. Thank you for listening to the Bootstrap Founder today. I really appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter at Avid Kahl, A-R-V-A-D-K-A-H-L. And you find my books and my Twitter course there too. If you want to support me and this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Get the podcast in your podcast player of choice, whatever that might be. Do let me know. It would be interesting to see. And leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. It really makes a big difference if you show up there because then this podcast shows up in other people's feeds. And that's, I think, where we all would like it to be, just helping other people learn and see and understand new things. Any of this will help the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day and bye-bye.